So we've been trying to organize a conversation like this for quite some time, at least the last few weeks, but it's probably been cooking away for a while because we talk a lot, you know, I, you do it with everyone. Yeah, you, you engage with everyone. And it's really, uh, in my no, opinion, really admirable. I don't engage with everyone. Are you sure? I mean, in comments, but I think I've probably had more long conversations with you than almost anyone else. So you're special. That's super cool. <laughs> no, I don't think I am special, but I do want to say something um, before we get into this. Um, I started following what was then in Trinzen, uh just before I moved to Spain, which was probably almost three years ago. Um, I started following you. <sighs> Because a friend of mine was like, oh, we were talking about Instagram and a friend of mine was like, there's this account called Intrinsen and it will blow your mind. They're like, the posts when you're starting off with it uh, are a little bit like heavy because you're like, whoa, this is different. And I'll admit when I started reading your posts, I was like, okay, I've not thought about this before. But then the more I read it, the more it was just like a depth charge. It just like struck something like way down deep. And it was like, okay, the more I read your posts, the more they made sense. And I, what I'm speaking, I know has been the experience for tens of thousands of people who follow you that um, the more I read it, the more it just became like obvious and clear. And there you were just like, the emperor's new clothes. You're just like standing there at the end of the village saying, hey, the emperor's naked, everyone. Hello. Right. In regards to horses. And that was kind of mind blowing. And then, you know, yeah. we started talking a little bit in the DMs. And when I moved to Spain, it was probably like the most terrifying experience of my life, not only personally, but also professionally. Like I sold my business. I was starting from scratch. Like I had no money in my wallet and we were sort of homeless for about a week when we showed up my horse wasn't doing well and oh. um i was just like oh my god and i'll never forget this i've not told you this but i'm going to tell you anyway and i'm putting it on the record but um i wrote to you and i said i'm so terrified right now that i'm not going to make it you know with my business and that i'm not going to be able to make a living with horses and that this isn't going to work and you said to me you said you got this. You said this to me. You don't remember, but you said, Lockie, you got this. You can do this. You said, I've started over many times in my life and it was always a good thing. It was really tough at the beginning, but I started over from the beginning and I made it. And you said, when I did my first course with horses, I had like 25 signups and like that was it. And you're like, you got this. And it gave me so much confidence and it gave me self-belief to keep on going. And, you know, I'm, I'm not, I'm not, you know, there yet, but things are going much, much better. And, you know, I, I have a functional business now and I'm, I'm doing it ethically and helping people and you were supporting me from the start. And I want to thank you for that. Yeah. <laughs> so I just wanted to put that on record. Oh, so that's... The, this, this call I... today, this call today, Kathy, I want to get you on record because something shifted in you after the Olympics or during the Olympics, something changed. And I got a sense of you that you were done. You had had it. You had had it. Yeah. And I saw you yeah. grappling with that not only in the, the student Zoom calls for the pain science course, which I check in on every now and then, but also in your posts and in our DMs, you and I were just like machine guns out going rah, 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 rah. And I'm like, I'm sure there are other people who need to hear this conversation too. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it, I would say that of course it was happening. And I know actually, if you think back, you'll know this too. It, it was already coming Cooking. before the Olympics. So the, sure. the Olympics was like the push me over the edge. Mm. So you went over threshold. I think that's when I for sure. Yes, there was trigger stacking. And, then, yeah. <laughs> and that was it. I, I, I it's sort of like, I'm not going to get past this. I, I mean, I'm not going to get past it in the sense that I'm not going to forget that I had that feeling. Yeah, I'm not going to go back to exactly the way that I was. So, yeah, I'm like, super grateful for that. You're a pioneer, Kathy. Well, you're 
You know that, yeah, right? But so are you. I mean, you, um, yeah, actually, yeah. I do. <laughs> yeah. I do. <laughs> That's not always a good thing, but yes. No. Um, but of course, so are you. I mean, you're you're doing something that in some ways is even more niche than me. Mm. And for a long time, I thought I was the world's tiniest niche, right? Mm. But we see how many people it's resonated with. But yours is is also very, um, you know, your your sweet spot. It's such an important one, mm. but it's it's not one that most people are even able to comprehend. And I think that there are a lot of things that you do that I don't fully understand, and you know why I don't understand them. However, I care about this community so much, and I've always known that there are only certain things I'm going to do with the community mm. and with the horses. Mm. I mean, there, part of it is a, I'm always going to stay in my lane, <laughs> you know? Yeah. Um, but not because I feel like I must stay in my lane, but because that's the lane that I know. And I'm not going to try to pretend that I can understand things that I really can't, or, or I'm not going to pretend that things are important to me that aren't, but I absolutely understand they're important to a lot of other people. Mm. So maybe in the very beginning, I, it would surprise me to see like how many of my students resonated so much with the things that you said. And, and of course I do too. And, but then there's a lot of stuff where I'm like, I cannot believe he said that. Does he really think that? And yes, of course he does. And you know, where you would just like drive me crazy. And then that's when I really came to value you the most is because there aren't a lot of people who I can argue with or disagree with who don't just end up like writing me off completely no. or you know they they unfollow they block they that's it right that's the end of the conversation when to me it's just a conversation right there yeah. there is no other emotional part yeah. of it and and you were the only person who actually took the time to explain to me the implications of some of the things I said that I didn't mm -hmm. even realize would have that effect. I remember because, that conversation. You know, that, yeah. mm. <laughs> because not neurotypical, but all the other times too, where we'd like disagree about something, sometimes pretty intensely, and then yeah, y you would, and then I'd be like, he's still friends with me. That's just amazing. Yeah. <laughs> because yeah. I'm not used to that. So yeah. I I valued that so much. And then the other thing that I really value is that. Um, is that, again, so many of our students really, uh, you give them something that I can't. And mm. for a lot of people, right, obviously not everyone because, every, you know, we're all different. But for a lot of people, they really needed that. And, and it was... A, and, and vice so, versa. So you just you give things you grew that the community. You give things that I can't yeah. as well. So we're sort of, I think both, this is just but the... Think how awesome the, that is. That's awesome. It's sort of like the, the issue of perspective, right? You know, I can hold up this object and depending upon where you're looking at it from, we're going to see a different shape. I mean, this is what I learned when I did drawing classes as a kid was we'd all sit in a circle around the one object and then we'd look at our drawings afterwards and we're all drawing the same thing, but with just a different point of view. And so I think we're looking at the same subjects with just a slightly different point of view. And it's never a bad thing to hear similar or even same information about the same thing through different voices and with different language. Um, this is helpful apparently for the human brain in learning and acquiring skill reasons because I need to, to talk to another professional in the same field who can handle and tolerate tough conversations i've reached out to quite a lot of other trainers especially over the olympics and i was like hey there's a conversation that needs to be had about what's going on with horses and if you're interested in having a conversation that could push the boundaries and kind of go there and just be really honest about what's happening i'm here for it and just like what you said i'm okay with disagreeing with people my i have no ego stakes in this game i really don't like if someone disagrees with me, I'm like, cool. Like that doesn't, 
I don't need you to agree with me and I'm never seeking external validation from like anyone because I'm not driven by external validation. I'm really driven through my own autonomy, um, which is something you teach so beautifully. Um, and so, and I reached out to a lot of people and I got a hard pass from some really decent people, really good people who just said, wow. I can't go there. It's going to alienate my clients. It's going to alienate my followers. I'm scared to lose business. I'm scared to lose clients. I'm scared to lose income. If I have those conversations, they're like, they all agreed. Yeah. Yeah. Those conversations need to be had, but they all set it off the record. And um, oh, wow. that's not. I didn't know going... that. Yeah, well, it's true. They all set it off the record. They're like, "Yeah, we agree that it's kind of bullshit what's happening, but we can't talk about it because we'll alienate our clients, and we want to have a business." It's still seen as professional suicide to talk about classical writers in any kind of derogatory way, unless you're a classical writer. But if you're a classical writer standing shoulder to shoulder with other classical writers and you're critical of them, you're just seen as being, well, competitive and nasty. Um, the whole, the, the classical thing, and of course all the abuse, classical or not, uh, that we now understand is abuse. And I, that's why I really like what you said about the emperor's new clothes, because it's like, how can we not just stand up and say, this is not okay? <laughs> There's so many things that people do with sport horses where even if you were a complete asshole, if you understood the science of what you're doing, you wouldn't do that. It's only going to hurt you in the end, even if you don't care that it hurts the horse. Attacks from a group of people who I keep wondering why we're not allies. Mm. And of course, that's like the positive reinforcement group. Yeah. We both even use positive reinforcement. Yeah. but. I often won't say it, and sometimes I don't say it out of respect to the people who really uh, care deeply about positive reinforcement because they're like, you're not a good model of it, which I'm not, uh, although I understand it really well and I have been using it for 20 years, but you know, the, I've evolved how I use it. For In fact, that's Intrinsen was about <laughs> originally evolving how we use what it. What happens when positive reinforcement goes horribly wrong? not because you were using it wrong, but because you were actually using it right. Communities. Um, and what you see is in fighting within the community about how to deal with their own stuff, disagreements and scrap fighting over what is ultimately really insignificant detail. And that's exactly what our critics, our quote oppressors want us to do. They want us to fragment off into this infighting but what we did see over the olympics was a uniting across these borders around saint boy as an example because it was so outrageously over the top right what happened they're to angry they're pissed off that in their local community using food reward is still seen as you're the idiot you're the pony petter what the hell are you doing? This is dangerous. You're spoiling your horse. You're going to make them aggressive. Positive what? Positive what? You're an idiot. Why are you using food to train your horse? This is not what you should be doing. Food is available to horses everywhere. It's not natural. They're so angry from being yeah. told again and again and again that what they're doing is not valid, that they're so desperate for validation that this internal conflict within themselves created by being constantly beat down on results in them beating down on each other. Even I even had someone this week who is a really big name in the positive reinforcement community come after me in a passive aggressive way because I they came after me for it. <laughs> they wanted to sort of co-opt the things that he was saying that fit their narrative. Yep. He used, so if they talked about the play system, mm they would completely corrupt it mm. and they would do little puzzles and you know how to get the treat you know things which was completely against right in against. his view of of and he's you know probably the leading expert in mammal play that ever lived right that it is rough and tumble <laughs> that if yeah. it's not rough and tumble it's, it's not, not even play, play. so yeah. it's just and, and his 
you know, his big breakthroughs for me in the in the stuff that I was doing were that, uh, you know, that the neuro endocrine profile of a real fight between mammals was very different from a play fight, even yeah. though a lot of times people can't tell the difference from they the outside if they don't really know those animals. That, but it's, you know, that busts the whole natural horsemanship thing of, oh, they, they play the game where who moves whose feet, you know, not. wins. And it's like, no, in play, the stronger animals, in fact, it's the only place it's known that the stronger animals will handicap themselves or else they don't get to play. So yes. they will deliberately allow the other one to move their feet as part of yes. that play. Yes. So just all ridiculous. Was they cherry that. picked what they wanted, That's but it. not the rest. And I'm going to get cancelled so fast if I say what I really think here. But um, yeah, it's it's not the first time um, I've said this, but let me say it again. Something that really troubles me is the way we treat each other. We spoke about it before, the infighting within the ethical horse training community. And I find it, again, Ironic. You mentioned the irony of mentioning Panksepp in regards to behaviorism and operant conditioning, but Panksepp was really critical of operant conditioning. In fact, on page four of Effective Neuroscience, really critical. He, said, he said operant conditioning is absolutely insufficient in understanding animal behavior and animal motivation. It's insufficient. He said it on page four. Well, that was you one know, of the... That was one of the kinder things that he said kinder about behaviorism. Said. I mean, yeah. And his, yeah. the whole book he, is about was... pushing to go further, pushing to go further. Yeah. People who are preaching kindness, ethical behavior towards horses, um, being completely unkind and unethical towards other people. So you can't be empathetic or ethical towards a horse if you're incapable of practicing it towards yourself and towards other people. Like it's just, if you can't do it to your own species, how can you teach and do it, really, really do it to a horse? And it's sort of like, I had people I don't last understand week it. had the social media equivalent of a drive-by shooting from hardcore clicker trainers because they were talking about food reward and mixing that with praise and with body language and getting thrown out of clicker groups for it. There is a way in which I am empathetic with a lot of what I think they're trying to fight against, mm. but it, you and I what both know that? until they're willing to be, well, I'll tell you, but until they're mm. willing to be more nuanced about it, right, mm. is because a lot of the things that I say that you say they are very close to the things that, you know, that I'm going to just call them assholes say to justify behaviors that they do with the horses mm. that are abusive. And yeah. so it, it looks dangerously close. And I have had people who I value who are in the plus our community who the, the few that are willing to talk to me privately a lot, right? And they have helped to explain this to me that, that they are pushing back against what we say, which is much more nuanced and, and, um, and different, fundamentally different from the way people talk about it when they're using like natural horsemanship. Mm. And, but, the, but the language can feel really creepy similar to them. And uh. so some of them have said to me, and I, I've taken this seriously, and I did. Tr I, I have tried to, over the years, alter some of the things that I showed because they've said you're giving people permission to do things that are bad that people want to do anyway, and I'm like, <laughs> I mean, like what? Am I? You know? And, and they're like, you're making it too easy for people to to justify things. Like when I, I talk about occasionally uh, what I'll call, you know, calming signal shaming, right? Uh -huh. Yeah. And a bunch of people wrote to me and said, I, I know what you're talking about and I, I do understand how you feel about it and, and even agree with how, you know, with how Kathy, how you are using it. But, and they have a point, right? They're, they're like, maybe the pendulum really needs to swing that far because there's been no calming signal shaming ever. 
So mm. is it really fair to say that's our big problem today in the horse world? And of course, it's not, right? When you watch the Olympics, you go, maybe there should be a lot of calming signal shaming, which I wouldn't necessarily even say is just behaviorism. It's like a certain uh, group of behaviorist positive plus R trainers that also at the same time believe the horse should never, ever, ever look anything but calm. Right. Well, mm. and to me, that's incredibly unhealthy in a million mm. different ways. Mm -hmm. And but then the other thing where I have empathy for them, too, is that a lot of people are dealing with traumatized horses. Right. Mm. But when they see horses that look like all the lights have gone out, <laughs> you know, they're, and that and that anything to do with the horse that shows any emotion at all other than pleasantness is a problem. Right. That that. I wouldn't want to go there. Lot. I mean, I, I think that's really lot. unhealthy. And I think I think you touched well, it, on something. It's, it's really sacrificing important. the horse. It's not... yeah. yeah. Um, maybe I'm a complete weirdo, and that's entirely possible. But <laughs> if I woke up tomorrow morning, and a voice I trusted said, "Lucky, everything that you're doing with your horse." Is horses, including the way you feed them, the way you keep them, the way you trim them, the way you talk to them, the way you handle them, train them, ride them, every single thing that you're doing. And if it was a credible voice, more than one even credible voice said to me, if you want change for the good for the horse, change every single thing that you're doing. If someone said that to said that to me tomorrow, for me, I can really honestly put my hand on my heart and say that I would have no problem in pivoting on the spot and saying, cool, let me let go of everything that I've built up right now and pivot into something new. Is pushing it back against the people who are so resistant to letting go to that which they have come from, that which they believe is they are doing well. People who get offended when they're like, well, you just talked about how horses shouldn't be in boxes, but I keep my horse in a box. That triggers me. I feel shame. I feel criticized. I feel that I'm not doing the right thing, but you think I'm not doing right by my horse. Oh, instead of going, maybe I shouldn't be keeping my horse in a box. Let me think about that. Let me change that. But they make it about them. And it's sort of this yes. slightly narcissistic attitude that I just like really don't vibe with and that's and the way the human brain works it's that cognitive dissonance they yeah. say it's the same thing you see at the olympics i love the horse the horse is well cared for double bridle behind the vertical sunken spine blood in the mouth i love the horse cognitive dissonance it's exactly the same human element in that situation of extreme abuse that you see in someone who doesn't want to even think about letting go of a small little detail. For making yeah. you feel like you were making your horse feel safe if you were bossing it around and being the leader, including inflicting pain, right? That you're, mm. you're actually, the horse wants you to be that kind of person. It's not that people are saying, oh, well, and that the narrative is which is, of course, complete bullshit. Horses are always just trying to test you. They're trying to yeah. get you, right? So that people can feel okay about it. Oh, the horse the horse is trying to get away with stuff because he's just messing with you or a million other things. Mm -hmm. It's not like people believe their horse isn't trying to, to resist them. They know that the horse is resisting them or the horse is just, you know, unhappy. Not not doing but what they want. They either don't know that there's any other viable option and also there's a lot of gaslighting and mm. and but mainly the trainers you know all of my life were always making it seem like it's just you you mm. need to get better but most horse trainers that i have talked to i think they know deep down that even though they're able to do things intuitively with the horses so that they don't, they, even the ones where they, they're clearly using, you know, pressure and release, but they're doing it in such a way where they have so much intuitive feel for the horse, which is, of course, what I imagine you have, that they don't have to be very abusive, right? The horse still doesn't have consent, 
but they're doing the absolute minimum of you have to do this. And in a way where their releases are so well-timed that at least the horse knows exactly, right, what he has to do to survive this. So they are, in that sense, much better for the horse, you know, using that system. Like, I think the whole system of horse training just is completely um, based on nonsense, right? Not, none of it is based in science, none and it. it's terrible. Well, I mean, unless, unless you want the science of, you know, force, but because obviously it works uh, if you don't care about the consequences. But a relatively small group of people who I think are capable of riding a horse with a bit. Mm -hmm. And yet, almost every trainer very quickly gets their clients in a bit. Little kids. Kids. There they are with a bit. And yeah. it's like, oh, the whole I've thing been in situations is so where messed up. I've, I've been in situations where I've put kids on horses and the horse had a curb bit on full leverage and you saw the kid pick up these reins with a confused expression. They're about to go on a 90 minute trail ride and they pick up the rein and they go uh, by accident. The horse goes, ouch, like this. And it's like, and I'm standing by and I'm allowing this to happen. And obviously I'm not in those environments anymore, but in that moment, not only was it socially unacceptable for me to say, I'm not doing this. I'm not doing this. And if you want to do it, go ahead. But I can't personally stand by and go to bed at night if I watch this and facilitate this in happening. Wasn't my horse, wasn't my farm. But I was finding myself, even without consciously choosing those pathways, so easily falling through the cracks and finding myself in equestrian environments where that was expected and accepted and normal. And it's so pervasive and it's so just everywhere that I understand again and I empathize with the positive reinforcement community who are so hardcore in pushing back on even adjacent even proximal adjacent folk like yourself right. and I who right. are similar but different. We're trying to look at the problem like the proximal adjacent theory from your pain science course, right? Got the problem and instead of trying to do the opposite, let's surround the problem with things similar but different so that the problem's no longer threatening, we can diminish the problem together. That's maybe one way of describing what we're doing, but they're not, they're like, no, 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 no. we're not doing that, we're gonna go the other way we're going to walk foot by foot against the current upstream uphill because it's been so hardcore current in one direction all the time against the horse and against the horse's welfare that we have to provide this other extreme so that people afterwards can come forward and provide a middle way. I mean, mm. my degree was kinesiology, right? Mm. I understood you these things. I understood exercise physiology. And then I went back for computer science and worked in artificial intelligence. Um, and then for a long time, I worked in game design where we were absolutely dealing with motivation. So I was teaching all of the motivation theories at a university for a long time. I knew all of this. And so, well, what I knew was that all of what we were doing was not right, technically even. But yet you lose your mind when you're afraid. So I let trainers talk me out of the things I actually knew. Whoa. And I just, and I've talked to, I didn't expect that those are the people that would start to do this. That's why I always said, I thought there'd be, you know, like 25 people on the planet who would do the things I do because I thought they would all have to be literally as desperate as I was to save a horse's life. Like if it's not life or death, they wouldn't do it. And I'm, I'm, so humbled because I don't think I would have done it if it hadn't been life or death. I would have continued to be part of the group, you know. It came at a cost for you, no doubt, uh, on some level. Which, which part? Uh, creating space for those people to come afterwards and say, hey, it wasn't life or death for me. I just think it's fine. And what you had to battle to create an option so that they could just take the fun option 
and how much work it was for you to create that option, it comes at a cost. It comes at a cost. I, well, I, I'm, I'm thrilled though, because yes. I think it, it means that there are people, th this is what gives me a lot of optimism, because it means that there mm. are people who in some ways care more about their horses than I did at the time. The thing that I'm really confused about is what is going on in the mind of the trainer who says, you can't do this without me, the kind of panic that they're going to lose the client mixed with maybe a bruised ego. I'm trying to understand what's going through the mind of a trainer because I, I don't get it. I, that's something I really don't get. I'm a pretty empathetic person and I really try to experience what other people go through so that I can understand their motivation. Cause that's just, that just, you know, that turns me on. I really I, like understanding the motivation of others, but I don't get it. I don't get it. And I've been I think, lucky I think I a lot that. of people No, but I think a lot of them, some of these people I knew really well, and I think a lot of them, they really did care about the horse. And again, they never looked at it as the whole system of how we're training and what, you know, the, the, the foundation was completely broken, right? But nobody mm -hmm. looked at it that way. Mm -hmm. It was just, this is how you train. This is what you do. This is how it works, right? Things, right? No, the system is terrible. And most horse trainers have no, absolutely no education in education. Mm -hmm. um, so separate what? from the horse, right? That's that's why I'm moving back to Can the I human you, side I saw, because I saw that in the the dance industry as well. You see uh, dance teachers in charge of the lives of young people, ages ten through eighteen, formative years of your life. Extreme training, extreme coercion, zero modern education upon how to treat young people, how to work with young brains, how to not traumatize young people. I mean, it's chronic. And, you know, oh, I know it's serious and um, it's not only it's not only in the horse world, dance world. It's kind of everywhere. It kind of permeates it's everywhere. It permeates every industry. Um, and that's why horses are so interesting for me, because it really is a, a playground or in some perspectives, a battlefield for where the human condition plays out in a really highly aroused technicolor way and how we navigate our experiences around horses and horse training says so much about who we are as people and i mean some of the best pressure quote pressure and release trainers i know they say straight up they're like horses don't like horse trainers that's what buck brenneman said i went to see buck brenneman in 2015 at aintree Racecourse in liverpool when he did his first uk appearance and one of the first things he said on day one was Horses don't like horse trainers. Horses don't like being trained on. They don't like that feeling. Now, what he was really doing was talking about all this stuff that you talk about, but in kind of a colloquial, hand over fist, learned through experience kind of folksy way. And his first lesson, he sat those British riders in Aintree Racecourse. There they were. They all had their shiny helmets on and they had their new saddles and they had their new chaps and they like probably a million two million pounds represented just intact alone in front of your eyes and they were all there they were ready to like go 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 perform be great i've got my clinic with this amazing guy and this was shortly after his documentary had been released so he was like kind of a celebrity at the time right and uh -huh. um they sat there for an hour and a half while he spoke that was the beginning of his clinic he just talked and i mean he went there and he went there in a way where he was basically like, uh, the foundation is rotten. In a nutshell, what he said was the foundation is rotten. The way that most wow. people come towards their horses is, uh, is trash. And we need to rebuild this from the ground up. I'm going to have all of you doing small, calm, quiet circles with huge integrity and huge quality. And that's what we're doing today. And he came in the next morning and his wife was there with him as well. And he said, oh, my wife told me that I should do more trotting because I understand a lot of you got really bored yesterday. And at some point, one girl, one woman who was wearing a Pirelli hat and a Pirelli saddle and she had the carrot stick, <laughs> had all the stuff on. At some point in Horsemanship 2 class, she just started trotting huge circles in the arena because her horse couldn't stand it anymore sitting there and listening. And I'm assuming 
maybe she couldn't either. And it was kind of like, I was hanging on every single word he spoke, just taking notes and like going, oh my God, it was really kind of powerful for me to see someone with all of that excellent timing and feel and all of that stuff basically turn up and say exactly what I said at the beginning of today. Uh, the emperor has no clothes, folks. Horses hate horse trainers. This system is defunct. And in my own way, in my own lane, I am rebuilding it. And, you know, he's not perfect. He did some stuff that I was kind of like, oh, yeah, I can see your dad wasn't a nice guy. <laughs> you know, you learned that from someone. But right. no one's perfect, right? We've all got something yeah. going on. But um, it's surprising to see what I learned was it was surprising to see that you can find supporters of even what we are doing in really unusual places. And this is why I find the pushback against people who are proximal adjacent, pushback against people who right. aren't doing the opposite extreme. The reason why I find that pushback misguided and problematic is because they are making enemies out of people who could be their allies. And it's like, don't you want more allies for your cause? Isn't that why you're talking about this stuff? Don't you want to get people on side? Why are you railing against me? I use food reward. Hello? I, I don't get it. I don't get it. I don't get I mean, it. There, there, so there's, there's something that I think is important. And this also has to do with you. I'm going to talk about, but like I said, they, when they see people, I think, talking about positive reinforcement, and then they look at what that person is doing, and it it doesn't match the best practices of a behaviorist approach to positive reinforcement, right? But people will use those hashtags and stuff. I can kind of understand their feeling, because it's exactly how I feel when people use the intrinsic hashtags. And they're and not it's doing like, intrinsic. I can like what you're doing, but say that's not actually intrinsic. And, you know, to me, the labels have values, right? You know, what you do is, is add the other crucial piece, right? Because a lot of what I do, it's not going to work for people if they don't really already have an understanding of how to have a, some kind of relationship with their horse or they're not or they're not willing to do whatever it takes or take the time right so that's why i think you are a huge asset for anyone who's doing the kind of stuff that i talk about because you're you're taking them where they need to go that i don't and so hope I, you know i i'm hoping that like some of the criticism that i get you can fix that because you know i'm pretty much like why would i work on calmness <laughs> I mean, I'm pretty, I'm pretty adamant about that, right? But people absolutely often need to do that because they don't have another way to actually access that. But the human no. can, yeah, exactly. The human brain is really good at saying one thing, doing another, saying one thing, doing another. I'm, yeah. if I could be, if there's one thing that makes me sleep well at night is that I do wake up in the morning and I am walking my talk every day. That's one thing that helps me sleep well at night. Yeah. But just I mean, to we chose back, them. They didn't choose us. Right. And just to circle back on something you, you started talking about, and I want to flesh it out just a little bit more. I don't think you know what that you were talking about this subject exactly. Uh, I don't even know if I knew that you were talking about it either. But what I the, 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 the difference between science and art, uh, between protocol and expression, between procedure and um, performance, between um, behavior and free choice, between um, uh, obedience and cooperation, these things are tiny nuances that we can talk about intellectually, but in a real world way with horses, really boil down to some kind of fundamental, important nuances when it comes to the horse's ethical experience of us. And I had a, I was blessed in my life uh, between the ages of 17 and 26 to have an amazing mentor who was Australia's premier performance psychologist in positive psychology. She worked with uh, Australia's Olympic athletes, Victoria's Olympic athletes. She worked with dancers from the Australian Ballet Company, from oh. Victorian College of the Arts. She worked with 
um, musicians, she worked with equestrians, she worked with anyone in a high performance field. She specialized in how to maximize your brain and get the most out of your body, your mind, your your spirit, everything in your performance industry. And she was non-denominational in the sense that in Australia, particularly, there's a huge divide between the artists and the performers and the sport people, right? There's a huge divide, which can kind of be loosely analogous to the, the divide in the equestrian community between let's say the science people and the expression and the woo people, right? Or the sport people and the non-competitive people. It's this same dichotomy that kind of plays out under different umbrellas, but a similar human condition is kind of driving these two dichotomies, right? Anyway, my beautiful friend, Paulette Mifsud, Dr. Paulette Mifsud, she worked with everyone. She worked with athletes and artists and she would sit there and look at me and say, Lockie, Lachlan, it's the same you both artists and and scientists and the, the sports and the expressionists they need the same skills it's the same stuff if we're focusing from positive psychology meaning what's right with you and building on that rather than what's wrong with you and how to fix it it's the same stuff and she was my um uh, performance psychologist my my art college in melbourne had performance psychology lessons for teenagers can you imagine and i showed up there and i was like awesome perfect chance for me to get an extra like 30 minutes in because i'm really tired today so i would go to her classes and she'd be doing guided meditations and talking about concentration profiling and focusing and mental optimization and i would just be there like sleeping and then one day she did concentration profile mini tests on us and I'll be real, as a dancer, I wasn't progressing. I wasn't improving. I had no concentration. I was getting injured a lot. I just wasn't going anywhere. And I had a lot of potential, but I was just really not going anywhere. And we did this concentration profiling. And I'm sitting there with my hand on my cheek like this, 17-year-old, you know, exhausted, overwhelmed, traumatized kid. And she sat with me and she said, Lucky in your classes do you ever have a problem gaining x skill because your brain does y and i was like yes and she went do you ever struggle with x because you get distracted by like a squirrel in the window i was like yes she's like do you ever have a problem maintaining x for what i said yes i was like okay get out of my head lady like what's going on she just said i can help you it's like let's book a session so i was having sessions with her and after eight weeks of her training, I improved two grades in my ballet exam, two grades. I went from a C wow. plus to an A plus after eight weeks, after like 10 months of stagnation, I jumped two grades in eight weeks with her. And then shortly after that, it was a hop, skip and a jump away from moving to Europe, getting a place in a prestigious school. And then when I got to the school, I had these really abusive teachers, which you know about. And when I struggled with these abusive teachers, who did I call? I called Paulette and we were there on Skype because that was the days of Skype and she was coaching me on Skype and she coached me all the way through all of that difficulty and I couldn't have overcome it without her. And she was all about positive psychology, motivation, mental resilience, mental optimization, how to improve upon your strengths and joining the divide between science and art and um, yeah, I mean, a few years ago, she called me one day, I tell this story all the time, but she called me one day, I was here in Spain feeding horses, and she said, I'm sick. And um, she she died a year later, of a really rare and horrible, aggressive cancer. And she was in her <sighs> late 40s, she didn't have kids. And she had said to me at one point, she's like, you're, you're like a son to me. And we were working on a project together that was going to join the divide between artists and athletes. We were working on a project together and she was working on certifying me as a performance psychologist. And um, before she died, she asked me, quote, to take up the flag for her. That's what she said. Will you take up the flag and continue my work? And so in my work every day, I really embody what she taught me. And it wouldn't even cross my mind to say to a client, a student, anyone who's learning with me, not from me, with me, because I'm learning probably more by teaching you than you are maybe learning from my lessons, right? It wouldn't even cross my mind to say to someone, you can't do it without me. It wouldn't even, it wouldn't, it's not even in the realm of possibility for me. And not only that's not special, like there is a whole realm of people who are like that. 
even and especially around horses. We're out there, but we're kind of insulated and protecting ourselves from the greater toxic equestrian community. If someone took emotional horsemanship and did hashtag I'm doing emotional horsemanship and I look at it and I'm like, that's trash. I'm like, cool. That is an inevitable result of growth. People are going to take what you're doing and they're going to bastardize it. They're going to interpret it in their own way. That is part of the artistic facet of life. You can get a hundred people and stand them in front of one painting and you will have a hundred different opinions. You can take thousands of people and expose them to the same trainer, the same horsemanship school, the same horse training approach, right. and you will have a myriad of experiences based upon what they're learning. Or maybe he's not I've, the easy I've guy. I've spent some time. I've spent some time with them in person. And? I've spent some time at ranch. And? <laughs> well, um, say it. <laughs> I think that there are good human beings right um i think they're good human beings i think they believe in what they do um but the system of natural of natural horsemanship is so fundamentally flawed and you know this is what they make their money on right H how do you back away from that when everything mm -hmm. that you do but they have they have made changes that really upset people the first time someone saw acknowledge that for some horses giving them treats would be a good thing people went ballistic like they felt so betrayed but what they're doing is preaching something that's really sometimes horrifying so some of the stuff mm -hmm. i saw in person was horrifying like what and uh i mean that's uh well i there's one that i have told uh before I, I think this idea of science versus woo or science versus art, right? I mean, first of all, this is another problem I have with a lot of the positive reinforcement behaviors in people is that they act like they say they're science-based, right? But they're only usually talking about one science uh, that's kind of in a lot of the psychological world is very oh, ancient and creaky, right? I mean, yeah. operant conditioning and, and classical conditioning, you know, uh, I mean, they exist, right? They are what they are. No one's going to argue with that. But using behaviorism for training uh, has been very controversial in the human world. And even maybe 10 years ago, no, maybe a little bit more than that. You know, I used to live and work in Silicon Valley. And at Stanford, a lot of these uh, the psychology PhDs would come out and they would say that until like Facebook games started to happen, and apps. If you were at Stanford and you started talking about Skinner and behaviorism, your career was like, really? really? You know, you're going to go, I mean, really? Um, and within like a course of maybe three to five years, Stanford was turning out behavioral science PhDs and they were getting, you know, these $200,000 jobs out of college. Um, and suddenly it was this explosion of all of these, you know, plus our games. And I was horrified by that because I'd already, years and years before that, I'd been teaching the dangers of uh, extrinsic rewards mm. on intrinsic motivation because it's something we, the, the, the downsides of all of these extrinsic reinforcements, which by the way, includes pressure and release. Yeah. So, Everything that is an extrinsic reinforcer is, by definition, coercive. Yep. So, including which is the food problem reward. when people are absolutely mm -hmm. so, um, it, which is, I think, the fundamental problem that a lot of the behaviorists don't want to acknowledge mm -hmm. that it's taking away autonomy. Now, there are lots of ways to use it where it doesn't have to. And, and you have to work really hard uh, to make sure that you're not using it in a really coercive way, except for when you want to be, right? I, I If I'm trying to teach a medical procedure and this is the best, safest, yep. easiest, pleasant way for them, I'm gonna do it, right? But everything yep. else, the, like the movement training and all that other stuff, right? Relationship stuff, I'm not gonna go there. Um, but so, you know, I, I had learned so much about the science of how dangerous this can be. So uh, one of the things that they call it is the over-justification effect. 
Yeah. And these are things that, it. I mean, we've known this for, you know, 30 years, but people don't want to acknowledge it, that giving an extrinsic reward that is purely externally regulated. Now, the external regulation matters because it really means that it's an, quote, if then, right, a contingent reward. If you do this, you get this, or you get the possibility of this, right? Uh, that, so that, that's a purely contingent reward, that if you do that with things that could be, could be intrinsically rewarding, so just motivating on their own, you have a great chance of lowering that intrinsic motivation, perhaps crushing it. And these effects are extremely robust, but I can't get most of the behaviors to even go there. talk about it, even though there. there's hundred studies going back to decades, right? It, it's, you want to read the scariest book on positive reinforcement, I think, on the planet. It's called Addiction by Design. Mm. And it's about what happened when the casino industry switched from the old style one arm bandits to mm. video slot machines. And they were able to incorporate the most sophisticated versions of straight up no, no question, positive reinforcement with intermittent variable rewards, all designed by behaviorists to, to keep people addicted, actually to get them addicted. Mm. And so it's, it's that coercion because even if you don't care about their intrinsic motivation, it's still coercive. It's not forced. So it looks like Better. it's not coercion. Yeah. Yeah, and, and it, it is. is if you don't, I mean, if you don't have to, if, if you can use it instead of any violence. Sure. I mean, if I have a choice between violence and that, I'm going to take that. But sure. it's, that's not a choice we should have to make, right? Exactly. It's like, are these our only should... options? Like, uh, extrinsic no. coercion no. or like beating the horse to a pulp? Like, absolutely not. These yeah. are not our options. And why are we all acting brand new? Yeah. Like, these are exactly what our options are. There are so many options out there figuring it out. I remember uh, a while ago I was working uh, with saddles a bit and I, used, I was traveling all throughout Poland and I went to Latvia as well and I was helping people fit and distribute saddles, etc. So I got to meet like a really broad spectrum of horse people in various different environments. Like I was working with 18 a hand German warm bloods at really like dressage classical places with, you know, shiny boxes and no turnout. And then I was at like, absolutely like country no stable fields we were doing the test fitting in their garden like next to their vegetable patch like totally like broad spectrum and i found that there are really good horse people everywhere uh, especially the amateurs are usually pretty good with their horses and their horses regardless of the rider's skill level actually kind of like their people and kind of got on with their people even and especially when the people weren't necessarily always making it easy for them it was almost like and i don't want to project and i could be wrong it was almost like the horses saw sometimes their people as a desirable difficulty they saw the person like a desirable difficulty getting along with them i think sort of so like, yeah they're kind of like well you're a little bit strange but like i'm good with strangeness so i'm gonna work with you and like it was kind of like and even not you saw people who just got along with their horses really well and i met this girl once who had been two years in the game with horses two years and she's like oh i trained my three-year-old to pee off in hand i was like what she's like yeah i'm like did you did anyone teach you to do that she was like no i didn't even know it was called a pr until later i was watching some video and someone told me that that's <laughs> what it was she was like i saw we were like lunging him and he was like you know trailing with his hind legs behind him and it was making him stiff and uncomfortable in the shoulder so i asked him to like trot and then stop at the same time and he just like pee up here let me show you and there was this beautiful two-year-old who just sort of went there into this gorgeous nice soft relaxed pee up and she was nowhere near, nowhere near a traditional environment. And I was just like, okay, again, the emperor has no clothes. I'm so not impressed exactly. by, by your prestige, your background. I'm not impressed by all of that. I'm impressed about how your horses experience their life with you, um, whether you train them or not. That's what impresses me. Um, the most and i think that's what drives me the most is that i've got tremendous faith in the amateur tremendous faith 
that in fact the amateur is probably the one most likely to call bullshit on all of this stuff and they're the most likely going to very quickly out outstrip and outskill even their local professionals in their abilities with horses because so many of these modern tools can get results so much faster i mean the the professionals who say i have used this tool for 20 years and i've worked so hard to get that result it's like you used that technique for 20 years and and that that is the result you're getting and you're celebrating this much you didn't think for a second that maybe the technique you're using isn't very effective you didn't like look around for like hey maybe there's a more effective way i could get this done maybe there's a faster easier smoother better way i can just like get this done like this lady i saw who trained her horse in two minutes to pee off in her garden because she hadn't been corrupted or gaslit by these trainers who said she can't. Things evolve. And why why would we hang on to all of that, right? We can still preserve a lot of the spirit of that, but yeah. not the, you know, implementations. Mm -hmm. Not if we know something that's different and better. And our use of horses is so different now. Mm. I mean, almost nobody needs a horse. It's right. got to come from the trainers. And that's really the tricky frontier to, to get into. That's a really tricky place well, to go. Well, I, I do. I think it is. But I actually have thought for a long time there, there, are, there are ways in which people like me, well, maybe not now, but I think most muggles could still absolutely benefit from the knowledge of a real professional and when I say knowledge, I mean kind of their deep percep perceptual knowledge about how the horse is moving, right, and how the horse looks. Now, again, she, you know, wanted to train traditionally, but she had an open mind as long as I came to her and said, I want to do this experiment. Will you help me with this experiment? And so I let her completely off the hook, right? Like I said, mm. this is just my crazy experiment but I could use your expertise. So she would help me develop a lot of things. And, and the way that, that we were successful together, and this is also, I think the way I approach it with the horses, right, is that I wanted her to give me the what, but not the how. Uh, so uh. for example, if somebody says the horse needs to really elevate the base of the cervical spine, lift up through the withers, right? Because, yeah. you know, he, if someone doesn't know what the spinous processes of a horse's spine look like, they might not even understand what kissing spines means, right? But yeah. a professional can say the horse absolutely needs to elevate through the base of the cervical spine, the thoracic slit, right? The human can learn that just perceptually, but if the trainer can help and say, this is what needs to happen. So I would ask her, and even earlier, my other mentor, Stainer, I would say, I'm not gonna listen to anything you tell me about how to get there. What do you want to see, right? And like, they would say things like, well, the horse needs to be underneath himself. And when you're on the horse, you need to feel like the horse is carrying himself and what this might look like, right? Or those, those legs shouldn't be so wide apart on this, you know? And it would be like, okay, bye, I'll see you in six months, right? And then they'd come back and it would be like, I there would use is. the environment and the tasks yep, and the, you know, that. all the stuff. And there it is, right? It's like, no, you, you I, I don't want to be corrupted by the way you're going to tell me how to do it. Mm. And that was kind of like the trickle down effect for me to kind of end up doing what I'm doing. It's that your personal factor that you bring to the horse really does have a huge effect on what's going on with you. And this is where I struggle with the behaviorist is this constant exchange of transaction and that the human can't be seen as positive unless conditioned through appetitive appetive whatever the stimulus it's kind of like whoa hang on a minute where did where did where did where do we go wrong there like you can you can socially engage with a horse and they can they can like that they can like who you are and how you be and how you show up and energy is not about well, escalating I, pressure and commands I, right I think, though, that one of the issues that they have is that before you can get to that point, you have to be willing 
to say I care about the horse's autonomy and if I am not doing it for the trees with the horse, there's no way that I can say the horse is going to want to be with me, right? And I, I feel exactly that way, that we, we can never have the expectation that somehow we're going to be able to magically get the horse to want to be with us. There's a lot of things we can do that will make that more likely. And there's a lot of things we can do to just stop all the things that make it unlikely, right? Just get out of our own way with the horse. But we can't, you know, so no, I, I think that's why a lot of people because you've got to, you've also got to are afraid. You've got to fundamentally understand what is consent. Not is what, not is what is consent exactly uh, as per you know different quadrant or style or approach or technique of training. What is consent for R plus? What is consent for positive? Re what what consent is being willing to get a no. So you can't then expect to then use your character or your personality as a coercive force exactly. upon the force's cooperation. That's so not the point, and that's so exactly. not what I ever talk about. And if that's like a, a, right. an expected or conditioned response that when I talk about using your your character, your personality, your emotional expression and awareness to like connect with the horse, that is not then automatically in my mind associated, connected, reinforced to being coercive with your personality towards the horse. That is like right. representative of a narcissistic personality disorder, which I'm pretty sure I don't have. I might be wrong. <laughs> I could. You don't know. The day is no, young. you you uh, don't you you don't seem um, to say that, but that is the message that a lot not of from you, think. but that's a message a, a lot of people get. Is yeah, that, like I'm a I'm great, well, so the horse loves me because I'm great. How can I, I get the horse like? There's a lot of how can I get the horse to like me? How can I get the horse to bond with me? How can I get the horse to right? And that no, I mean, you you walk that fine point. line. That's not the. But point. a lot of people don't. Don't they yes. think that right? They think that it's about how can I get the horse. As soon as you're, how can I get the horse to, right? How can I like, get, how can how I get can the horse I make, to do what I want I have, without how force? I, how, can I, how can I, 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 it's all about How can what, I get? <laughs> how can I get, how can I make, how can I have, how can I do? This is all, when people ask those, how can I get questions? I'm always like, okay, let's start right there. How can I get? Firstly, right. let's like, let's look at that. Uh, you know, why do you think you deserve anything from the horse in the first place? What, where do you get off thinking that the horse owes you anything? And why are you so fixated, obsessed or, or focused on getting what you want all the time from the horse? And this is where I talk about emotional maturity, because I think that I don't want to project, but I think that's kind of juvenile to say, I didn't get what I want. Hmm. And like pout about it. Like the horse doesn't like me. Hmm. Pout about it. Oh, I'm not good enough. Hmm. Pout about it. It's not like that. You know, it was a large paddock and yes, there was electric fences at the paddock, but there was like completely full hay nets and water and a stable and a hill and things to do and friends to be with. If they wanted to peace out and leave, they could. And I was okay with that. And what was really funny, especially the horses that had training done on them, is as soon as you would let them walk away, they would walk away and they'd take like 10 steps and they go, wait, they're not <laughs> trying to get me back. They're not trying to get me back. Right. Who are you? And that was the curiosity, which then brought them back to you. And then they're like, you're interesting. This is different. You gave me the ability to leave so that therefore I want to stay. Right. And you don't know that unless you try it but trying it is like a hurdle some people just really can't cross because they're just holding on no so hard no. a lot of people also just just don't have anything else to do with the horse right i mean mm. just like i mean most people still don't really have anything to do that doesn't involve riding right like if you can't mm. ride the horse what do you what do you possibly do right yeah. and then you do something that's maybe even worse lunge right i mean it's like that's what you do when you can't ride so i think people having more and more things that they can do with the horse Dude. and i think that's a problem too because for this sort of way of working with horses because like a lot of people will go yeah but none of you ride and it's like well actually we do and a lot more of us can but just you kind of we forget like it becomes well. not so important Mm -hmm. Yeah, and maybe you can, maybe you can, you stop needing it. Mm -hmm. You can still really enjoy it, right? And this is a way that enables it. Like a lot of people write to me and they go, I did this knowing this horse would never be ridden again. Promised this horse I'd never ride him again. He he hates riding, right? And then 
two years, it might be two years, but two years later, the horse is like, oh, hell yeah, you know? Yeah. <laughs> and so, yeah. Um, but you have to be willing to know that you can't make any expectation of what the horse will or won't do if you have consent, right? You, you can, you know, you can do all the things, but you still can't guarantee. And but that's my goal, is to increase the number of things the horse can do hard things or even scary things for which the horse feels like, meh, no big deal. And that way, but the other thing that I do that of course is really crazy, um, but it's how I actually started with Tramer, is that I will click, which they all know the clicker really well. I will click if they're moving away from me, taken off with a lot of purpose. So if they're like, oh, I'm getting away from you, I'll click. <laughs> I mean, like, I'm rewarding that. Half the time they don't come back, right? But they hear it. So it's like, I don't care what you do. If it's if it's purposeful and you're asserting yourself, that's a good do thing. Do it. And now I can high five you for it. So because I'm not really rewarding them for it, that's the thing, right? That when they have enough adrenaline, um, there. this is the theory that that helps reduce the chance of the over justification effect there is robust science around dopamine because they don't and... want to confuse the horse yeah but like the, it, the, they don't the want confusion dopamine is only released. which is how we learn from confusion confusion is cognition that's that's what we know confusion is cognition otherwise you're you're not teaching you're just repeating and rehearsing something and that's very different from learning yep. repeating rehearsed movement is very different from learning Com something completely. new or developing yourself or uh, but we have very robust yep. science around when you're predicting that you will get the reward and when the reward is expected that the reward system in the brain and in the bloodstream decreases dramatically over time so being unexpected with the food reward in fact, is one of the most effective ways of making sure that the food is always seen as rewarding. So we don't get back healthy movement yes. by puppeteering his movement. Yes, we have to give him more and more movement challenges yes. and and allow him to express himself. And if he keeps yes. expressing himself exactly the same way, then yes. we just add variety to the environment. We oh all need God, to be puppeteering is so harmful. We all need to harmful. be dancing more. We all need to be dancing more as children, as teenagers, everyone needs to dance more because if you've ever been to a club where the music was on point and you'd had just enough libation to be free of yourself and just enough adrenaline to feel motivated to move without, and just yeah. enough darkness and smoke around you to not be self-judging and self-analyzing the way you're moving <laughs> and you're with people you trust enough to not judge you the way you're moving, how you're moving or why you're moving and you just moved to the music. If more people had experienced that, then they wouldn't be so right. confused when we start talking about, yeah, horses can like really enjoy moving. They can just really enjoy That's it. That's intrinsic motivation. All you have to do is watch a foal that's in a natural yeah. environment. It's, it's hard out there for kids, you know? And that's, that's why a lot of young people are drawn to that's these true. highly, highly uh, micromanaged forms of training because they've never experienced autonomy. I mean, my parents had me on a loose leash when I was a kid. I chose my own high school. <laughs> It was my choice. They said, we'll help you make yeah. your decision, but like it is your choice what high school you go to. And one day when I was 15, I turned around to them and I said, I want to move to Germany and go study dance in Europe. They were like, sorry? Like, and they were driving a car and they looked behind and I'm in the back seat. Like, yeah, I said, this is what I want to do. They said, okay, are you sure? I said, yes. And they went, okay. Well, I'm the choice. age we'll where you do it. We, didn't have, we didn't have helmets or seat belts. So, I mean, right. <laughs> you know, kids just, you're just gone. And hopefully you're home sometime after dark and nobody knows where you are. And I, I know friends who are my age were all like, how are we alive? I mean, all the shit we got into and all the scary situations and, and ridiculous things. And but we it's lived. different but, now for so um, many young people. But it's very different. They've well, never been th raised this is in something, you know, environment. This, this way of, of coaching and training, you know, it, it's become far more popular in the human world now. Mm recently but not in the equestrian world of course but 
So a lot of worldwide, a lot of the coaches in various sports, they are dealing with this exact issue of what do you do with kids who just come in and expect you to tell them exactly what to do? And then, uh, so the, when I was talking to that one guy, like I said, was my first real mentor in this. And I was describing how some, some of these horses have always been told exactly what to do. And when you're not telling them what to do, they just kind of don't know, or, or that can even feel stressful for them. Yeah. And I think that's a point where a lot of humans will give up. They'll go, oh, my horse just doesn't like that. He right. wants to be told what to do. And it's like, no, it's your job to help him get through that, not give up. And they said, he said, a lot of these elite athletes, which I'm sure now you can kind of relate to part of this too, is that they, especially if they were really promising from a young age, they have been managed at every stage. And then by the time they're a professional, I mean, they have actual managers and agents and coaches and everything they do is absolutely very meticulously. And if you just say, all right, let's do this crazy ass thing, right? And they're, they're just, they're very stressed out by that. They're like, ah, if you don't tell me what to do and how to move. Now, some of them, if they're really good, a lot of agents will say to the coach, don't how he does it. Because a lot of horses, they wouldn't necessarily tuck their pelvis under them, lift their, their forequarters and their thoracic sling and bascule their neck unless they're in a high state of rage, a high state of breeding lust or an extreme state of play, which most horse people would find frightening to experience. So you see a lot of these horses being asked to do these behaviors, which are naturally connected to these very highly aroused emotional states. They wouldn't naturally do those behaviors in a state of calmness, but they're right. asking the horse to do that movement, divorce it from natural emotional connections to that movement and do it in a state of calmness so the person can feel safe and su successful and it's kind of like it's a mind for the horses no wonder they have so much trouble with it and no wonder why so many of these horses in a high state of collection are working with a low level of tension just kind of crackling under the surface because this stuff is will is waiting to kind of come out and that's why you see those horses they'll be super super controlled and then a flag jumps in the corner yes! and boom they explode they because explode they underneath the corner. They're predisposing them to the spookiness. But if you just allow them to feel the way they feel connected to that movement and you, you truly see that in dressage. That, oh, and if you truly you see that in dressage that, a lot. It's a big My sister big is subject. a dressage queen. Yes. She, I yes, mean, I've heard. she's at a barn with Olympic horses, right? And she just got her first Spanish horse. This is really adorable. You know, if you put the horse first, then, then my goal is the horse just has to be regain his sort of original movement capability, mm. right? Which is not the capability of high level dressage. No. It's just he can original do he movement. can get the job done mm. all the way he needs to, right? So that his mm. nervous system goes, oh yeah, you're agile. You can escape a predator mm. either direction, right? I'm if good. you need to sit and spin, I can. You got it. Yeah, that's the way that we approach sort of an authentic calmness, because people try to get a tense horse who can't move calm. No, no. His nervous Yesterday. system is like, you're not safe. You're not safe. You're not safe. You're you're not badass. You can't move if you had to. So that's where you get that thing I really don't like. Which is people going, oh, but my horse always just looks to me for safety. And it's like, well, how sad yeah. the other 23 hours. No, perfect it's real life example. Yesterday, you know, we moved home three weeks ago. And yesterday I took my horse, Sunny Sanson, out for our first little hack down the river and back again. And, you know, he's got some chronic health issues and stuff and we manage it. But, you know, I got on him. We walked down the, the river and then I got on him and he was just like, oh, thank God, here we are again. He was just like doing his long walk. You've seen it, you know, that really long stretchy walk he's got an out oh, yeah. ears on. And every now and then ears went back because he was just kind of like, is this good? Are we here? Yeah, we're fine. Okay, good. Off we go. And my dogs were with me and they're running around and they're really small. And my dogs ran after some wild pigs and they came back again. And when they came back again, Sunny saw them came, come back. And then as he watched them come back, one of them rustled a bush just nearby enough to us. And he kind of did like a little on the spot spook. He watched the dog came back. 
but he did an on the spot spook and immediately was calm a second afterwards. It was almost like he was saying, have I still got it? Could I, if I needed to? Yeah, I still could. Okay, great. Let's keep going. He wasn't genuinely afraid. Exactly. It wasn't a real panic. It was almost like he was checking him with his, bo- with his body. If I needed exactly. to spook, could I do it? Are my feet good? Am I sound? Is the rider balanced? Is it going to hurt? Have I got the muscular power? Let me just check. Have I still got that emergency button if I need or want it? And I wasn't bothered by it. I was kind of like, oh, there he went. And then immediately after, I kind of shook myself off and he kind of shook himself off and kind of went, okay, good. We still got that. Right. Where are we going? We're going home now. And it was like a lot of people would have found that spook to be like, oh, my horse is spooky and nervous. I need to work on it. They don't feel safe. It wasn't that. It was something totally different. It was something totally different. It was really it like was an the appropriate horse, response. <laughs> appropriate response. And the horse checking in with his body just to make sure, have I still got it? Have I got it if oh, yeah. I need it? You know? Kathy, I, I've I had mean, such Dreamer, a good time who, with you, you today. Know, who almost died. Let me just we finish do. this one tiny story. Go ahead. Let's, one let's tiny story because you just said Go it. Ahead. It's, it's, it's two sentences. That Go for it. After Dreamer's, you know, was ready to die, right? The first time that he spooked after all that, yes. I just cried happy tears. Wow. Because he's alive he again. He <laughs> and now still all these years later, if he spooks, I'm like, yes. Yes. I mean, he doesn't panic and freak out, but he's like, he's aware he's alive. Yes. He's sensitive to the environment. Yes. And that's so, yeah, that's that's healthy. healthy but freaking out means that their nervous system doesn't feel safe. So that's that's our job, right? That's their difference. nervous system should feel safe and competent. Yes. Yay. Oh, I've had such a good time, Kathy. Thank you All so right. much for your time today. It was just spectacular. Thank you. Thank you. I had a great time. Thank you. It, it was worth getting up early. <laughs> I'm glad. I'm glad. Bye. I'm, a, I'm a shit morning person too. Take care. Bye. Bye.